Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual iHeart Science Festival. Thank you to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Ariel, and I'm a museum educator at the Harvard Museum of Natural History, and I'll be your host for today's events. Today's theme is tiny creatures. Let's welcome Paula. Hi, Paula. Paula Paleo is a graduate student in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. Take it away, Paula. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paula. Thank you so much for being here today. And today I'm going to be um, showing you about how we study bacterial toolkits. Bacteria are found all throughout our body. Our body is home to trillions and trillions of bacteria. And they're found in all corners of our body. They're found in our mouths, in our stomach, on our skin, even within our reproductive organs. And bacteria play really important roles in our health. Where bacteria are essential to keeping us healthy, but there are times when bacteria can also contribute to some damage in our body. And we're really, I'm really interested in studying how bacteria play a role in our health. And the way I do that is I'm a graduate student and I study microbes. And this is the lab where I work in. It's called the Mallinckrodt Building here on Harvard's campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this lab is full of, this building is full of science labs. And so that's me. And I work with a professor named Emily Bauskas. And she's a world renowned professor who has studied microbes and how microbes can affect our bodies. Some of the key questions are how bacteria are influencing our bodies, how they help us in health, but also how they can play a role in causing things to go wrong. And so bacteria and what they can be doing in our bodies really affects us and our health. And I'm trying to figure out what it is that bacteria are doing and how they're doing it. So where are bacteria in our body? Most bacteria in our body actually live among our mucus. And you might think of mucus as something that's bad, like you're sick and have a lot of boogers, but mucus really lines all the inside parts of our bodies and are really important for keeping our health. So your saliva is considered mucus, the fluid in your eyes is mucus, they line your gut, your stomach, and even your reproductive organs. And so mucus acts as this protective barrier over your epithelial cells and bacteria live on the mucus and within the mucus. And some things that can go wrong are when bacteria start to degrade your mucus down. And so bacteria can make this mucus become thinner and gain more access to getting closer to our epithelial cells. And there is where the problems start, is that bacteria coming in contact with our epithelial cells can cause inflammatory responses. But how are bacteria doing this? How exactly are bacteria messing with our mucus? And what are they physically doing that can break down this mucus? And also what do they physically do that can hurt our epithelial cells? Well, bacteria produce enzymes. And enzymes you can think of as a toolkit. And these toolkits allow bacteria to gain access to resources such as sugars. For example, here, if this enzyme would help a bacteria gain access to complex sugars, it, would, it can break down, carry out these chemical reactions that will slowly break apart the sugar so bacteria can eat them. That's an example of something an enzyme would do. And these are their tools. And if you thought of tools, like we think of tools, um, you can pretty much predict what people are doing. Like let's say we looked into a person's toolbox. What you find in that toolbox might tell you a little bit about what they're doing on their day-to-day -day lives. For example, if I saw a paintbrush and a bucket, maybe that person's painting a house. If I saw a stethoscope in somebody's toolbox, maybe they work in a hospital, they're a nurse, they're taking people's hearts, reading people's hearts. In my toolbox, for example, you probably see a lot of glassware and goggles because I work in a lab. Or you might see scissors that someone might be a hairstylist. And so you can see that if we looked into a person's toolbox, we can figure out what they're doing and how they're using these tools. But for bacteria, how do we do that? How do we figure out what 
bacteria are doing, what tools they're producing, and how they're using them. Well, lucky for us, bacteria carry all the instructions to all the possible tools that they could make in their DNA. And so we can look at all the DNA that bacteria have and predict what types of tools are they making? What are these enzymes? And what are they doing? And as we learn about what these enzymes are doing, we can figure out, okay, there are enzymes that are important for breaking down sugars, some speed up chemical reactions, and others can build cell surfaces. As an example, the bacteria that are found in your yogurt, they're there because we like those types of sugars that they're breaking down and producing. Um, as we've learned about enzymes that can speed up reactions, we can use them in industry and use them to produce biofuels. Or in your laundry detergent, we actually use enzymes that break down fats so we can take out stains from your clothes. And enzymes that help build surfaces, build bacterial cell surfaces are also really helpful because bacteria need protection. And so bacteria that are more antibiotic resistant, it's because they have enzymes that build stronger and stronger cell wall surfaces that prevent the antibiotics from destroying them. And so as you can see, the more we're learning about these enzymes, we can use them, but we also figure out what enzymes are doing that help bacteria and harm us. I'm really interested in understanding the enzymes that are involved, involved in premature birth. All right, so in the birth canal, there are trillions of bacteria, and we've figured out that there are enzymes that bacteria produce that might play a role in premature birth. And premature birth is damaging because when babies are born, before they're fully developed, that can be bad. About 10% of all the births from developed countries like the US are premature. And being born premature is sadly one of the leading cause of death for babies. And scientists and clinicians have figured out that the type of bacteria that are present in the birth canal seem to play a role in the timing of the premature birth. Women can have very different types of microbial communities in their birth canal. They can range from being pretty constant, they are dominated by one type of species of bacteria, and people also have communities that vary and increase in diversity. And the higher diversity you have of bacteria here, it actually is causing more problems. Um, and scientists and clinicians have figured out that the more diverse the vaginal microbial community is in the reproductive tract, the higher risk there are, they are to having premature birth and being at more risk to infection. This is pretty different from what you might hear about places like your stomach, where in your stomach, having more types of bacteria is helpful because you, have, you can break down foods better, um, but every part of your body is different. And in the reproductive tract, what we want is actually stability. And so having a constant type of bacteria present in the birth canal is more beneficial because it maintains a stable pH, a stable environment that will ultimately help the developing baby. Um, but now that we know that more diversity causes problems in the reproductive tract, we can start to think about why or how bacteria are doing that. And so again, we can predict, look at all the DNA that's there and predict what enzymes bacteria are doing and start to figure out what reactions these enzymes are doing that impact our body. And what we know right now is that the enzymes that have been linked to premature birth are actually mucus degrading enzymes. This is one example. Um, and so in the birth canal, on the skin lining, there is mucus layers. Um, and so our epithelial cells are covered by a mucus layer of, that contains bacteria. And bacteria here are degrading this mucus and making it thinner. And the thinner the mucus is, the less protective it is to your epithelial cells. When we zoom in and try to see what these bacteria are doing, the mucus at its very core is very complex branches of proteins and sugars. And that's what gives it its properties. Mucus is a lot of water. Um, like you can think of jello, jello has a ton of water in it, but you added water to the sugar. 
that made it into that jelly form. And so mucus's basic structure is these sugar branches. And enzymes that bacteria are producing are clipping away and degrading this mucus, um, damaging its physical properties um, of protecting you and your cells from the bacteria. This is a problem, as you can imagine, when there's a pregnancy, because the mucus layer here is protecting your skin cells from the bacteria. But there is also a very thick mucus plug that blocks the entry space where the baby is. And so when bacteria are degrading this mucus layer, that can make it easier for them to climb through this opening and access the space where the baby is. And this is harmful because it can cause inflammatory responses or other responses from our own bodies that are not sure of why there might be an infection where the baby is. And so that might contribute to having premature birth. And ultimately the enzymes that are playing a role in this, the more we understand them, the more we can try to figure out how to stop this. And so how do I study bacteria exactly? Well, the harmful bacteria that are found here are mostly anaerobic, which means they need to grow. For us to study them and work with them, they need to grow in a space without any oxygen. And that's pretty hard to do because we need oxygen to breathe. So how do we physically work with these bacteria? Well, we need to make a space for bacteria to live in. And how I do this is we set up these anaerobic chambers, which are just like a big bubble that we flush nitrogen and hydrogen gas into it and remove all the oxygen out of it in order to keep it anaerobic for the bacteria to be able to survive. There's even um, oxygen scrubbers that will take out oxygen from that air bubble and just change it into water so that we can remove, um, really keeping this anaerobic for bacteria to live in. And in here we have incubators where there are higher temperatures and so we can put bacteria in there to grow. How I would work with this is this is one of the lab members that I work with. Um, and we have to put our hands through the gloves in this anaerobic chamber and then work through this space. And it's kind of hard to work with <laughs> day to day because the only way to bring things in is through this box that you, you see here in the background. It's called a, an antechamber. So everything you want to bring in has to be anaerobic. So you put it in this box make it into a vacuum, flush a ton of gas through it to get rid of all the oxygen, and then open the doors and let bring those samples in. And so it's pretty hot to work in there because I'm wearing gloves, I put my hands through the gloves, and then I'm wearing gloves on the other side of it. But all of this is to keep the bacteria sterile when we're working them. And over here you can see um, the person in my lab is working with samples, with pipettes, and we can bring in the bacteria frozen and start to work with them and let them grow up and study what they're doing, what the activities that they're doing, what are their enzymes like, and so on. And so that's how physically I would study these enzymes in lab. And this is me <laughs> cleaning this anaerobic chamber so you can see how big it is or how small it is. <laughs> um, and so, when there's a contamination or just regular cleanup, I would open this chamber. So you can see now there's oxygen in this chamber because the door is not there anymore. And I'm inside scrubbing this with bleach. And so that's what I do in my lab. And really, why does this matter? Why is it really important for us to study this? Is that it's because bacteria play a really important roles in our bodies and premature births are they, like I said, they happen in 10% of births um, throughout the country and they're the leading cause of death for babies. And that's bad because we want to reduce the amount of premature births that are happening. And one way that we can do that is the more we're studying these bacteria and the more we're studying the enzymes and how they're damaging our bodies, we can begin to design drugs to stop the enzymes from doing the damage. And so the bacteria might be there but if we can design drugs that block these enzymes from degrading our mucus, for example, maybe it will allow our mucus to restore itself to a healthy state and protect our body better. Or maybe we can block the enzymes that allow the bad microbes to grow um, 
in our bodies and to maintain our healthy state. And so ultimately that's my goal to really dig deep. Like, as you said, we're, we're looking really, really deep, not only at what the disease state is, what the bacteria are there, but what tools are they doing? What reactions are they doing? And that's how we can really begin to understand how to prevent premature birth from happening. And I would like to thank everybody from my research group who helps me work on this. I've been working in this lab for about two and a half years now, have a couple more years to go, but I'm really excited to continue working on this and figure out the enzymes that bacteria are using and how to prevent them from causing disease or from being involved with premature birth. And I'd like to thank everybody. Wonderful, thank you, Paula. And we have some great questions coming in. So let's see what people are wondering about. Um, one thing people are wondering about is, um, what are some of the different shapes of bacteria? We could see some in the pictures, but what are some of those different shapes? Yeah, so some of the shapes that you can see are when you have, so when clinicians take your samples in the clinic, they will take a swab sample of a woman, spread it on a slide and look at it under the microscope. And you can see that they're usually rod shaped, but when you start to see more like round circle shapes of bacteria, or you start to see loose skin cells in there, you can, or yeast cells, that's when you can figure out that there's damage. Um, but mostly they're rod shaped. Sometimes they have flagella or sometimes they're more round shaped. Um, yeah. Excellent. Another question we had is, is having a lot of different types of bacteria in a reproductive tract harmful in general or just during pregnancies? No, so we normally have trillions and trillions of bacteria in the birth canal and it's usually not a problem. Um, and it, but when you have more and more diverse bacteria that are causing the inflammation, it can cause problems not only during pregnancy, but it can lead to conditions like bacterial vaginosis or yeast infections. And so those are usually microbially driven, like bacteria are the ones causing those. Um, so it's not just in pregnancy when bacteria can be causing problems. All right. Um, and um, how, so this is a question from a, a six-year-old and they want to know how do bacteria get in your body? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so bacteria get to your body from basically the moment you were born. The moment baby passed through the mother's body and went through the birth canal, the baby comes out covered in just stuff from the mom. And so all the bacteria we were first given are from our mom's body. And it's different if you were born through C-section, you exit it through your mom's stomach instead. And so the bacteria that would be on your body are very different. Um, but you get them first from your mom and then from your environment, from the doctors that are around you, your home, everywhere. So thinking about your how you do your work, what would happen if you put your bare hand in that chamber without air? If it were my bare hand, I think it would be fine. Nothing would go wrong, but I could not survive in that chamber. <laughs> there is no oxygen in there. Um, but if I were to put my bare hands in there, I think it would be fine. My skin would not be burned or anything. Um, yeah, it would be fine. Cool. Um, and what is your favorite part of working in a lab? My favorite part is that I get to do experiments every day. And I'm very lucky to work with a lot of other scientists and clinicians who give me samples of bacteria that they've grown up from women. And so I can use, I literally have a list or catalog of a hundred species of bacteria that I work with. And if there's a specific one that I'm interested in, I can grow it and the next day start looking at how it grows or start studying the enzyme activity that is there. So I think it's always really exciting where I can choose what kind of bacteria to work with and talk to doctors and ask them what's interesting and what should I be studying to figure out what's going wrong. That's very cool. Um, are there other diseases that are caused by degrading mucus in the body? Yeah, so in the stomach, some problems that could happen are like ulcers and colitis where the skin cells in your intestines and in your gut are being damaged. And that's because the mucus there is not being protective anymore. And so your stomach skin cells 
are just exposed to whatever you're eating and the bacteria that are there. And so that is also something where the where the bacteria could be damaging your mucus and just makes your skin cells a lot more sensitive. Mm. Um, and have you started to consider different treatments to address this problem in the birth canal? Yeah, well, existing treatments right now are antibiotics, but they're not really the best right now for the birth canal because with antibiotics, you wipe everything out. You pretty much kill all the bacteria that are there and you just let the community try to grow again. But depending on if you started off with a pretty diverse and complicated community, it could be that the diverse community just decides to grow up again versus you're, you're not exactly selecting for the healthy driving bacteria to grow back. Um, and so some alternative um, therapeutics that we're considering are these enzyme inhibitors that would prevent the damaging bacteria from gaining access to sugar and growing there. Um, other things are specific type of toxins that only kill certain types of bacteria. Um, yeah, those are some examples. Interesting. Uh, so going back to the shapes of bacteria, if most bacteria look like rods, how can you tell the differences between them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so from looking at them, we can't really tell what they're, what's different about them. And so what we have to do is collect all of their DNA. And so once we pull all of their DNA, we can start to read what that DNA is saying. And that gives you signatures of which ones come from certain types of species. Because a lot of scientists have already sequenced a ton of bacteria from all parts of our body. And so you can compare it to see what the, does this bacteria look like something that has already been studied. And a lot of bacteria that we grow in the lab those are only a small portion of what's actually in our bodies because we can't physically culture them. We don't know what to feed them sometimes for them to grow. And so some of them can only be found in our body, but we know they're there because of the DNA that we can find in all these samples. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, so here's another question. Are there conditions that are more conducive to diverse bacteria growth versus similar bacteria growth? Um, yeah, there are certain practices like, um, well, there, the, the pH is, is very important. And so to maintain the stability of the, of the lactobacillus, which is the type of bacteria that's found in this low diversity state, the pH needs to be really low for them. And they actually drive that because they're producing lactic acid, they're producing hydrogen peroxide, which just makes the whole environment more acidic for them. Mm. But when the pH starts to change, um, some of that can be due to adult practices. Um, the pH can start becoming higher and that allows other bacteria to grow in them. Once the pH goes to five or six, not 5.5, then that's more conducive to the more diverse bacteria to grow. Mm -hmm. So here's a question from an 11 year old. They're wondering, is it possible to have a room that has no bacteria in it at all? Could we ever have something that was like that free of bacteria? Oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes we want to study like one type of bacteria, and so the way like we can't really study with our bodies, and so we use mice, um, and we can use we can grow up mice that have never seen the bacteria before, and so in these rooms, we pretty much have to sterilize everything. Bleach and UV light can kill everything, and so these rooms are very protective, and people come in with full hazmat suits on. And the mice that are born have to go through several cycles of being born from moms that have seen fewer and fewer bacteria until you get to a mouse that has never seen a bacteria, for example. And so there are rooms and spaces where we can do that. Wow, so, so even inside that mouse's body, there's no bacteria? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's and they're not the healthiest, actually. They actually need bacteria to develop properly. And so it's really hard to produce a body that has no bacteria in it because they're, they're really important for our body. They're more helpful than damaging, I think. So, so going thinking about that and thinking about the good bacteria, we had a six-year-old wondering, how do good bacteria fight bad bacteria in your body? Mm -hmm. So the good bacteria can be very cooperative. And for example, in the birth canal, they make it very acidic. So think of like a lemon, certain things like lemons and other things don't. And so the healthy bacteria like that lemon acidity, and they will make that environment like that. 
they'll also produce kind of weapons or like toxins that will kill the the harmful bacteria and so the more helpful and healthy bacteria you have the better they are at protecting yourself because they themselves on their day-to-day lives are battling against the, the the damaging bacteria and how can you tell if a bacteria is good or bad yeah well i really don't like calling bacteria good or bad because in reality they're living their own lives right and they're all they're doing is trying to eat every bacteria is just trying to eat but sometimes what they're trying to eat is not good for our body and so that's when we consider them like they're bad for us in our bodies or sometimes bacteria depending on what food is available act a different way and so that's some of those behaviors are what's damaging to our body. Um, and so we can tell which ones are acting more, which ones are acting in a bad way in our body because we keep finding them in sick people. Like, like for example, the, the coronavirus, right? We see a lot of people have these same symptoms. Like, hmm, what is that? And we figured out, oh, it's that virus. So the same thing with our body. If we keep getting some kind of stomach disease and if we find more and more that, oh, people with a stomach disease have this type of bacteria maybe it has to do with this bacteria that's how we start to figure out some of the key players um, in diseases oh interesting and going along with that and thinking about how our bodies interact with bacteria how does this interact with our immune system Mm -hmm. yeah so our immune system is also producing things that will um, attack certain types of bacteria and so for example, in the birth canal, there are bacteria, the, like the lactobacillus ones are the good ones, but the, but the ones that are causing diseases have different types of cell covers. They have a lot thicker cells. And so our immune system knows how to attack the thicker cell to bacteria. And so our immune system is allowing the good ones to live in our bodies, and it's only selectively attacking the ones that are harmful. So our immune system and our healthy bacteria work hand in hand to keep us healthy. And we've had a few people ask this question, and it's what is your favorite bacteria and why? Mm -hmm. Well, my favorite one is actually one of the bad ones, or not not the bad ones, right? Um, So it's called the Prevotella. And this is a bacteria that has like a rod shaped, but I really like them. They are one of the ones that I'm studying that might be causing premature birth. Um, But I like them because the way they grow is they're on media. But in my intro slide, I had like a slide where bacteria are gone. But the media where they grow in is red. And that's because for some reason, these bacteria need something from sheep blood. (laughs) So the, the media that they grow in is red and the nutrients from the sheep blood is what's helping them grow. And I, I think that's really cool. That's neat that there's a bacteria that needs a really particular medium to grow and really particular. It, is it something that they eat? Is it like a food from the, the sheep's blood that they need or? Yeah, yeah. It's like not, it's not that these bacteria are feeding on the blood, but sometimes we just can't figure out what they like eating. But so something comes like very nutritious is like blood. And so something in there is bacteria using to eat. We just don't know what it is. And we just give them all the options instead of trying to figure out what's the specific thing that they like to eat. Excellent. Well, thank you, Paula. I think we are out of time for questions right now. Um, Thank you for answering so many great questions. Bye, Paula.